Uh, it's, it's always great to be with you, and somehow when schedule was set up this year, uh, dates had, had not been uh, locked in, and when uh, we were trying to get me up here, uh, any of the available dates, there was a conflict, so uh, the offices got together and just figured out, was there one day I could come in for, so, so here it is. I was glad to be with uh, many this morning and then again tonight. Uh, we uh, were not able to uh, ship materials up to be here for you. But if you go to my website, AskDrBrown.org, you can see all the materials, the resources that we have. We have thousands of hours of free materials there, videos you can watch, uh, messages you can listen to, articles you can read, literally thousands of hours. If you're not connected with us on a regular basis, when you go there, AskDrBrown.org, A-S-K-D-R-Brown.org, when you go there, uh, make sure you connect with us either to get our, our weekly emails or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. Uh, We're super active on all these platforms and and ministering to you on a regular basis. So again, ask Dr. Brown, askdrbrown.org. And if there's stuff that's of interest to you uh, in our bookstore and things like that, a lot of it you can just get through Amazon Canada and others, our e-books, so you don't have to worry about paying shipping from the States and things like that. All right, um, I can give you a bunch of my own ideas, theories, and half-baked uh, latest thoughts, or we get into the Word. So how many vote for the Word? Okay, great. Even if you didn't, that's where we were going anyway. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we honor you, we adore you, we reverence you, we love you. We ask you for insight. We ask you to give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying. We ask you to touch us and change us so we can go and touch and change our world around us. Speak truth to us through your word. Give us a heart to respond so we may be doers of your word and not hearers only. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to speak to you tonight about important aspects of revival, namely the glory of the Lord and the fear of the Lord. And we'll start in Exodus, the third chapter, It's a familiar passage. This morning, when I spoke about revival and asked the question, why do many people reject revival? Why does a true move of God start and then stop? What stands in the way? I explained that revival is often too intense for many. The way God moves, the things that he does, the controversy that can surround it is often too intense And I explained that revival above all is a season of unusual visitation, divine visitation. It is God coming in unusual power and intensity because the Holy Spirit is always in our midst and indwells us as believers and God's presence fills the universe and yet there is an intensity of the presence of God, an unusual aspect to to God's presence, God's working in seasons in revival. That's where you can mark them. You can say at this time in history there was an awakening here or there was a renewal movement here. You can trace it. You can see where it goes and and what happens with it because it's that real. A season of unusual divine visitation and, and it produces deep repentance. It produces supernatural renewal. It produces sweeping reformation. It produces the radical conversion of sinners in the world so it touches the church, it touches the world. And the impact is deep and lasting if it's true visitation. What I want you to understand, though, is from the Old Testament to the New Testament, to this day, God's nature remains unchanged. God's nature remains unchanged. It is true that He works different ways in different seasons and with different emphases. And we all know John 1.17, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus the Messiah. But it's the same God, it's the same nature of God, and the blood of Jesus does not diminish the holiness of God at all. And when God comes in revival, it's the same presence of God that came in Old Testament times as well. I don't mean everything is identical in terms of how God moves and manifests himself, but I mean it is the same unchanging God. Malachi 3 tells us the Lord speaks. He is the Lord. He doesn't change. Hebrews 13 reminds us that Jesus, the Messiah, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10 and told them the things that happened in the Old Testament happened as examples. 
happened as lessons so that we could learn from God's dealings with Israel. Exodus, the third chapter. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Uh, Let me just say that this, in a sense, is a picture of revival from a distance. It's unusual. It's different. Why is this happening? I've never seen this before. It's curious. It has my attention. But when you get closer, you encounter God. When you get closer, you come to understand that this is not just some interesting curiosity. God himself is there. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. It's starting to get a little heavy now. It's one thing to see this burning bush and to be intrigued by the sight. Now God is speaking to him out of the bush. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. There's this progression of fascination and wow, this is amazing and we've never seen this before to now encountering the voice of God and God himself to this sight becoming so holy that you're afraid to look at it. The holy presence of God is one of the great characteristics in revival through the centuries. God visiting his people and coming in a way that manifests His holiness, that then reveals human sin, that then produces great repentance, that then produces the joy and the transformation. Now, some years back, I was wondering about ways that God would move today. Is it always going to be the same? Well, on the one hand, just when you think you've figured it all out, To paraphrase Oswald Chambers, just when you figured out how God is going to move, He's not going to move like that again. Just when you figured out when we do this and this and this, God moves like this and this and this, once you try to put it in some type of a a box, it's not going to happen like that. But are there always going to be the same characteristics? And I know some revivals are are marked more by joy. And some revivals are are marked by by, by singing of of new songs. And some revivals are marked by other things. And some have a heavier impact on the lost than others. God's going to move in different ways. And different situations are going to call for different aspects of God's moving. And yet in the midst of it, there's always this encounter with a holy God. Let me share an interesting thing that happened to me over 20 years ago. I was scheduled to speak in Sweden... A leader there had reached out to me after reading my book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, about the church and the Jewish people in history. He reached out to me to speak for a series of meetings, and he was going to have me speak in six or seven key churches, a different city, every night. The meetings were all set up, and then he called me and said, Brother, we have to cancel the meetings. It's not a good time for a foreigner to come. We've just had some controversy with a foreigner that was in, and, and the meetings, were, people thought God was moving, others thought it was crazy. We didn't know what to make of it, but there's a lot of confusion, and it's not a good time for you to come. I said, well, I didn't invite myself. When it's, when it's the right time, I'm glad to come. But I wanted to know what happened. He said, well, we had this particular brother that was in, and when he would preach, people would start to laugh, and they claimed to, to be receiving holy laughter and so on, and people thought they were having a great time. And then he said to me, He said, but let me tell you what happened afterwards. And it was the strangest illustration that he used because he didn't realize it seemed what he was saying. He said to me, there's a guy that's been in our church for many, many years, a married man with children. And he said, this man was in all the services laughing, laughing, laughing. Oh, he's having a great time. Oh, holy laughter. Right, right, right. He said, 
two weeks or so after the meetings, he comes to talk with me privately. He's not laughing anymore. He says, Pastor, I need to share something with you. And he begins to confess that he has been sexually abusing his children for years. The pastor had to bring him to the police to turn himself in. And the pastor said, see, this guy just came with this message about laughter, laughter, and this is not a laughing matter. I thought, well, could it be that this man encountered God in the midst of these meetings and the sign that he encountered God was deep, heart-rending, agonizing repentance? My, my point is that God may move in ways that we're used to, ways that we're not used to, but the proof of the pudding is going to be we're encountering a holy God along the way. And, and when people claim to have all types of experiences in God and meet with God and encounter God and they're very trivial about it, they're very loose about it, they're, they are, it's, it's, it's not a big deal to them. I wonder how deeply they've encountered Him. I, I wonder why it is that the people in Scripture were staggered by the presence of God, were overwhelmed by the presence of God, were changed by the presence of God, could not go on living in open sin and rebellion because of the presence of God. And you have others that encounter Him. It's just like, no big deal. Just met with the man upstairs. No, you did not. Or maybe the man upstairs you met with was not God. You met with somebody else. But when you really encounter him, you know, you hear someone give their, their you know, they're getting some, some award, some Grammy award or something. I just want to thank the man upstairs. You think, okay, keep praying for that person because they don't know God yet. I'm all for intimacy. We, we know him as Abba, which is kind of halfway between daddy and, and father. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a close, close term with, with it's a child with, with a dress a parent. God has put the spirit of His Son in our hearts by which we cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8 and Galatians 4. We have that closeness. We have that intimacy. I walk in a sense of recognizing God's love free of condemnation 24-7 and have for many, many, many years. But I reverence God. I reverence God. No, the fear of the Lord is not a servile fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. That servile fear, that's not what we walk in. Or the fear that a kid would have of a drunken parent that you don't know if he's going to embrace you, if he's going to beat you. That's not the God that we serve. But we have a reverential fear. We have a reverential honor. When, when, you, when you read through some of the laws in the Pentateuch, in the five books of Moses, it's, it's pretty shocking to read, do this, do this, do this, so you won't die. I mean, you're just reading, okay, how do we do this properly? Put on the priestly garments. Do this, don't do this, or you'll die. Can you imagine you're, you're putting something together? You get this, you know, new, new lamp or something. You've got to assemble some things, and you're reading the instructions. Be sure not to mix these wires or you'll die. I mean, you have that repeatedly, and then you have people approaching God and dying. Okay, what's the lesson there? What am I supposed to learn from that? As a New Testament believer, reading the Old Testament, what am I supposed to learn from these examples? And what am I supposed to learn from the fact that it was the same holy presence in the book of Acts? And that the fear of the Lord is a theme in the book of Acts too. And it's not a negative theme, it's a positive thing. God is being reverenced and honored and awed by His people. That's why Hebrews 12.29 can quote Deuteronomy 4.24 for our God is a consuming fire. Same God. Same God. Yes, we have boldness to approach the throne of grace through the blood of Jesus like no one had before the cross. We have an access to the heavenly, holiest place of all in a unique way. We can come cleansed, declared righteous, forgiven, by the blood of Jesus, it's utterly remarkable. And yet it's that same holy presence. It's that God who is a consuming fire. And it's that same holy presence that is there in revival, time in and time out. People encounter Him and they repent of sin and they are changed and they are renewed and they are transformed. In Acts the fifth chapter when Ananias and Sapphira drop dead for lying to the Holy Spirit, what does it say immediately after? And great fear came upon the whole church. The, the, the body seeing what happened, the body seeing the, the, the penalty of playing games with the Holy Spirit, lying to the Holy Spirit, the fear of the Lord was there. 
You say, is he going to get me next? Well, if you love the Lord, why would you think that? That's where you have to renew your mind. That's where you have to understand the love of the Father. That's where you have to understand the standing that we have in Jesus. But you realize we don't play games with a holy God. In the end of the book of Exodus, we read about the building of the tabernacle, the the erecting of the tabernacle. And I remember, as a new believer, reading through the Bible the first time, and to be perfectly honest, my friends and I all got saved out of the hippie rock culture movement, so the, the, the first things that we would read in Scripture were all the visions, the book of Revelation and parts of Zechariah and Daniel, because that was familiar to us, this type of imagery, you know. We were, I remember the early days, we're like, wow, that's in the Bible. The Bible is cool, man. And um, in, in fact, let me just tell you how raw I was in those early days, how little that I knew. There's a, there's a, a, a dear friend here, a, a world-class Old Testament Hebrew scholar. He'll get a special kick out of this. But, you know, the Bible, this is God's word. This is, this is the you know, it's the Bible. It's the Holy Word. So I'm reading the Bible, and the Bible we had then was, was the King James. And I, I read it cover to cover, I don't know, five times or so the first couple of years and memorized a good 4,000 verses out of it. So, you know, love and respect and honor the King James. But that was the only Bible that we had, the translation we had. And I'm, I'm reading it. It's very, very early days. I'm brand new in the Lord. And I, I'm reading it, and I notice that there are words in italics. Words in italics. Hmm. Well, italics only means emphasis, right? Um, or it could be like in a title, a title of a book or something, you put in italics. But it's emphasis. So I think, okay, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to do this. Anybody have a King James Bible here with you? Anybody happen to have one? Uh, yeah, on, online. Okay. Yeah, would you mind bringing it up, sir? Okay. So, so uh, I, I thought, okay, it's emphasis. I'm going to read this. I'm going to, and I'm going to, thank you. I appreciate it. I'll meet you. I'll meet you part way. Thanks. Okay, great. All right. And it's good. It's a good thick one, too. <laughs> so I'm in Genesis, the first chapter. And, ah, oh, it's big print, too. Thanks. That helps these days. Ah, oh, but you know what? It does not have the words in italics. Oh, no, no. Here it does. Here it does. I just wasn't seeing them. So I think, okay. It's emphasis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God saw the light that it was good. All right, so this, this wasn't quite working. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the the herb yielding seed, and the fruit, tree yielding fruit. So I thought, okay, it's not emphasis. It's not emphasis. That's not what it is. I thought, this is the Bible. This is God's word. This must be a code. That if you just read the italicized words, there's a secret message. But hang on, hang on. I am the first one to discover it. <laughs> well, I was pretty psyched. I mean, I was, I was pretty psyched. So here we go. Was, was, were, were, land, land, and. So I realized that was not the case. It was not secret, secret message. I'll just put this back over here. Uh, because I was brand new. I was absolutely brand new. And you say, what, what is it? It's, if it's not a secret code, if it's not emphasis, what is it? Actually, you have to skip every tenth word and then turn it upside down. And then if you can look at it through, if, when you do, take a picture with a selfie with every tenth word. And then when you do it, then you'll, it is a personal prophecy for you. Yeah, that's how it works, actually. No, what it is is if that explicit word was not there in the Hebrew or the Greek, they would put it in italics, just to tell you. So in in Hebrew, you don't always have the the word to be. So if I say, he is a man, I would just say in Hebrew, he 
man and is and ah uh, wouldn't be there. So that's, that's all the italics are in case you've been wondering. So I'm like, I knew the Lord wanted me to go there. I've been wondering about that for years. So there you go. That was, was anybody wondering about that? Today, maybe we could say the, the Holy Spirit led me. There, there we go. It was just for our friend in the front row there. So I'm brand new. I'm, I'm reading all this stuff for the first time. And now I'm going to read through the Bible. I'm going to make it through the Bible. I remember the first time through, I made it to the genealogies in Genesis 10. And that threw me. I got through the first few of them and then Genesis 10. And then, then I had to restart. And then the next time through... I, I, I was in Exodus, and this, I mean, it's all amazing stuff, Genesis and Exodus and the Exodus from Egypt and the Ten Commandments, and then God starts giving the laws. And that started to get a little tedious, but then there's a little, little more action, and, but then, now he's giving all the instructions how to make the tabernacle. I mean, it's, it's detailed. He's starting Exodus 25 through Exodus 31. It's like, and it, then it keeps going after a few other details come up. It's like, it's amazing stories. But I thought, man, that was boring, boring, boring reading about that. And I'm not a builder. I, I'm not a carpenter. I can't conceptualize this stuff. It's just like, yikes, that was boring. And then starting the 35th chapter, it says, and they built it like this. And like, it repeats the whole thing. They, they did this, they did this, they did this, they did this. I'm thinking, come on. That was just my first experience. But when you come to the end, when you come to the end of Exodus... They did everything as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, as Moses said. They did everything, they did everything, they did everything. And you get to the end of it, verse 34, what happens? Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. A lot of times you hear the Hebrew says this or the Greek says this and sometimes it's accurate, sometimes it's not. But if you've heard that the Hebrew word for glory is kavod, that's correct, and that it has a sense of weight, weightiness to it, that's correct. That, that same word is used for the liver in the body because that was considered the, the heaviest organ. That same word could be used if someone had a lot of substance, a lot of riches, that same word could be used. The same root could be used to, for someone weighed down. The same root is used for honoring father and mother. There is substance to it. There is, there is weight to it. And when God's glory, when the cloud filled the tabernacle, Moses couldn't minister. The, the presence of God was there in a tangible, weighty way because of which Moses actually couldn't minister. It would be like you bumped into something. You, you couldn't do it. Overwhelmed by that presence. And the same thing happens when Solomon dedicates the temple. And you read it in 2 Chronicles, the 5th chapter and the 7th chapter. The glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. The priests can't stand and minister because the presence of the Lord is there. And, and, and those that, that are not used to the things of the Spirit may find some of this talk strange. But many of us have experienced the weight of God's presence or the weightiness of the anointing of the Spirit. And this sense of, of God coming in and God taking over. These are things that produce reverence. These are things that produce awe. These are things that are not easily trivialized. These are things that, that change you out of divine encounter. I remember preaching in Korea one time. We had had a, an amazing conference, an Israel and the Church conference in Korea, and some amazing things had happened on my previous visits, my, my first few trips there. And now it was about the fourth or fifth trip, and we had an incredible conference, and at the end I, I brought a message on why I knew that Israel would be saved. And at the end we went back to prayer, and if you've ever been in the Korean church, the, the praying Koreans are like... Nobody you've ever met, I mean, by the hour, praying and crying out and praying and crying out. Just was there a little over a week ago, and a pastor was talking about meetings that he had hosted in his church that he said for, for 40 days straight, they had 1,000 people in his church every morning praying beginning at 4.45 in the morning. These are hardworking people. And I remember that night we went back to pray and I got off the pulpit and went in the altar area with everybody else. And we, we, we got back to praying for the salvation of Israel, for the salvation of the Jewish people. And I remember that, that holy presence came down in such a powerful way. I got on my knees. I couldn't stand. 
I literally had to get on my knees. And then I felt the holy presence of God so deep, so deep that I couldn't even get on my knees. I had to literally get on my face. And there laying on my face, I heard the Lord say, I'm going to save Israel. <laughs> this is my work. This is God's work. There, there is something about the presence of God, something about the glory of God that is awe-inspiring. And, and if we want revival just because we're, we're a little depressed or discouraged and we want some joy, God can individually renew us and God can individually revive us. But I'm talking about when, when God comes to a place, when God visits a place, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, there's something awesome and glorious about it. And there's an aspect, as we see in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, that the Spirit fills the house. This wind, the sound of a wind fills the house where they're sitting. God taking over. Jesus taking his rightful position as head of the church. And when he appears, when he begins to work, when he begins to manifest himself, it produces a holy awe. If if someone claims to really know the Lord and really walk with the Lord, and they they have no sense of the awe of God, again, we... uh, we should be intimate with Him. We should know Him as, as Father. We should know Jesus as our closest and best friend. There's nothing that we hide from God. He sees and knows everything. And so let me say it again. I'm not talking about work, walking in a servile fear or being afraid that God's out to get us or is going to hurt us. I'm talking about a holy awe for a holy God. I don't expect that on the, the day we stand before Him, we'll just come in, kind of give Him a high five and, hey, big daddy, man, nice to see you too. No, there, we, we'll give account to him one day. Every one of us. And as I understand it, not giving account for our sins, but, but giving account for what he's called us to do as stewards. Romans 14, 2 Corinthians 5 tell us that we will give account to God. The parables of Jesus tell us that that will happen. And often when revival comes, it's, it's almost like a judgment day in the midst of this age. God breaking in and suddenly you look at the way you've been living. God breaking in and suddenly you see the, the hours you've been wasting or the sin you've been playing with or, or, or the spiritual games you've been playing or whatever it is or the self-deception you've been walking in, your eyes are open. Why? Because God wants to hurt us? No, because He wants to help us. It's just like when you go to a doctor for an exam. You, you, you want to get a good report, but a good doctor is going to tell you the truth. And I, I posted the other day just a comment that, that a, a, a preacher or a pastor, not talking about sin because he doesn't want to alienate his, his, his congregants, is like a doctor who won't talk about sickness because he doesn't want to alienate his patients. One of the Puritans said that ministers are physicians, not cooks, and they shouldn't study the, to please the palate, but to cure the patient. When that presence of God comes, He often reveals what's wrong because He wants to help us. Because He desires our repentance. He desires our purity. He desires to bless. When, when, when the prophet Isaiah spoke for the Lord in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, words that are then quoted by, by John the Baptist, John the Immerser, or, or about him in the New Testament, prepare the way of the Lord. Make, make the rough places smooth. Make the crooked places straight. If God's going to come, we prepare for His coming. And when He comes, we want Him to be welcomed. It would be like someone is going to stay at your home. You get short notice that some relative is in town and they're coming your way and they need a place to stay. And that room is where you threw all the clothes and the junk and and now you've got to clear it out. Everybody hustles and you get it as ready as you can because someone's coming to visit. Well, how do we act when God's coming to visit? How do we act when God wants to manifest His glory, manifest His presence, manifest His Spirit among us? We prepare the way. And that's why often in the lead up to revival, there's repentance that precedes it. Because we're turning away. As we're pressing in more to Him, we become more conscious of areas where we've, we've fallen, areas where we've compromised, areas where we've gotten in a rut, or areas where we just lost something that was very precious that we once had in God. It's, it's been said that the problem with deception is that it's so deceiving. And when we think of Jesus rebuking the congregations in Asia Minor, when he rebukes Sardis in Revelation 3, he says, you have a reputation for, for being alive, and yet you're dead. They probably believe their own press reports. They probably believe that these things that were said about them were actually true. 
hey, we are the happening church. He says, you have a reputation of being alive, yet you're dead. And then Laodicea, what does he say? You say, this is what Laodicea thinks of itself. You say, I'm rich, increased in wealth, and have need of nothing. You don't realize you're, you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Who can imagine being in that state and being that self-deceived? But this is what can happen to us even as believers. When God comes, He shines the spotlight on things. When we press into Him, when we begin to cry out to Him, we realize something's missing. He begins to open our eyes to see. Right about two years ago, we were on vacation with some of our family. We were, we were all together in Maryland. And the grandkids were going to go in the pool. Just kind of a quiet day in the back of the hotel there. They were going to go in the pool. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll join them. But I just, you know, had swim shorts and put a t-shirt on and was going in the, going in the pool. And our older daughter was just taking pictures of everybody. And she took a picture of me playing with the kids. Just, you know, different pictures. And when I saw it afterwards, I was, I was mortified. I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. Now, I understood I was overweight. I understood that, that I'd be healthier and better shape if I lost weight. But just there in that picture, I was mortified. You ever hear the saying, pictures don't lie? <laughs> and that, that was a final straw that, that God used to help me make a radical lifestyle change. And I've been blessed and thrilled to, to have done that now. August 24th will, will mark two years from, from the chains. And in fact, in fact, the next book will be the first book that Nancy's written with me. So I've, I've written it together with my bride, Nancy. Uh, it should be out early in the new year because they say, New Year, New You. And it's called Breaking the Stronghold of Food. Yes, you can pre-order it today. Uh, <laughs> But, but all that to say, I showed that picture to friends of mine who knew me then, and they said, Mike, you don't look like that. In, in, in other words, you're not that heavy. The fact was that this picture rightly captured things that we normally didn't see because we have a way of hiding them. And as unpleasant as that illustration is, so it's, it's for me, it makes me uncomfortable even to share it. The fact of the matter is, that's what happens when the presence of God comes. That's what happens when the glory of the Lord comes. It suddenly helps us to see ourselves as we are so that we can turn to the Lord for mercy, for repentance, for change. One of my friends years back agreed to go to marital counseling with his wife. It was an intensive week where you would go and spend several hours a day with a couple. And they would meet with each individual. They would meet with the couples together. And he was calling me from there. And you know, like any marriage, it's a two-way street. There are strengths and weaknesses on both sides. But he was calling me and saying, Mike, I know you recommended this couple. I know you said they're a great couple. But honestly, I'm only here for my wife. Honestly, she's getting a lot of the ministry, but this stuff is, is just not me. And I'm not having these problems or these issues at all. And I'm, I'm here for her, but I'm happy to support her. But Mike, you know, she's got the needs here. I didn't say anything. It's like, mm, okay, okay. Another day goes by, he calls me. He said, I, I'm, I'm, worse than a, I'm worse than Adolf Hitler. I am, I'm the worst human being that has ever lived on the planet. I, and he starts going on. I, am, I don't know how my wife even stayed in the same house. Oh my God. I am. Suddenly the light went on. Suddenly, aside from the blood of Jesus, aside from the mercy of God, aside from the kindness of the Lord, he saw himself in stark reality. And he was un, absolutely undone by it. There's debate about the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, the sixth chapter, he has a vision. He sees the Lord high and lifted up, right? He hears the, the seraphim, these angelic beings saying, Kadosh, 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 Anonai Tzvaot, Melochah Haaretz Kvodo. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, filling all the earth with His glory. There's a debate as to whether that was when he received his calling, and it's put there in the sixth chapter, uh, just because the first five chapters serve as, as an introduction, or was he already prophesying when he had that encounter? 
Was he already being used as a prophet of God? Because when he encounters God, what does he say? I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm undone. Oily kinid meti. Woe is me because I'm undone. I don't think that Isaiah woke up that morning with that same self-consciousness. And when it says he saw the Lord high and lifted up, he sees him in the temple. When I used to read that initially, I just assumed he had a vision of the Lord in the heavenly temple. But then it struck me, well, why? More likely he's a prophet in Jerusalem. He lives in Jerusalem. More likely he went into the temple to worship. He went into the temple to worship as he did at other times. And while there, he encountered the Lord. Maybe he had prayed to God in that temple many a time. Certainly he had. Offered sacrifices at certain times. Participated in the rituals there many a time. And I'm sure that he would have done it in a reverential way if he was a God-fearing man. But now he actually sees God. And, And notice, God hasn't said a word to him. God hasn't preached to him. The Lord hasn't said, Isaiah, let me read your mail. You said this yesterday, you did this the day before, you remember that thought, remember... No, he doesn't say anything, he simply is. And his holiness is so overwhelming, the brightness of the light of God's presence, so overwhelming that Isaiah is undone. And of course God cleanses him and purges him. And notice how he does it, with hot coals from the altar. There's that wonderful song, Take Me Into the Holy of Holies, Take Me In by the Blood of the Lamb. And often when I'd sing that song with other believers, I would, I would pray for everybody because I, I thought, I don't really think we're thinking about what we're saying. Take the coal, touch my lips, here I stand. Come on, you know, Pentecostal, charismatic, kind of the, just that nice pose, head tilted to the side a little bit, hands up in that, Receiving posture, that blissful smile. Take the coal, touch my lips. Here I stand. Try, try saying that at the next barbecue, all right? I mean, take the coal, take the coal, take the coal, touch my lips. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, we, we often miss divine reality. It, it, it's painful to be cleansed. It's wonderful, but it's often painful. When God strips down deep inside of you, we, we hate some of these things that are in us. So we, 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 we feel we let others down, or how, how could we have lived like this? It's painful, but it's wonderful be, because the cleansing that comes out of it is wonderful. I'm not talking about God disciplining us by hurting us. I'm not talking about, well, you, you suffered sickness because that's how God was showing you how to be pure. I'm talking about the purifying process is a holy process. Repentance is something that can go very, very deep. When Paul commends the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 7 about the godly sorrow that led to repentance that brought life, he talks about the the, the tears. He talks about how zealous they were to clear themselves because God worked deep down inside of them. What, What I'm saying is that so much of what we often do is superficial. Sometimes our preaching and teaching is is superficial. Sometimes our worship is superficial. Sometimes our concept of God is superficial. Sometimes our concept of revival is superficial. But when God comes, when visitation comes, it's awesome. It's overwhelming. Oh, listen. I've, I've never, ever in my life, ever in my life, experienced the joy of the Lord like I did in times of true revival and outpouring. Yeah, as a brand new believer, I encountered the joy of the Lord over and over and over again. Every time I stepped into a church service and we'd sing these old little hymns, I'd just be so overwhelmed with joy. When I'd pray, I'd meet with the Lord, so overwhelmed with joy. But I'm talking about in, in a corporate setting and God moving everyone together. In the years in, in Pensacola and some other settings I've been in, the, the joy was exquisite beyond words. The celebration, exquisite beyond words. I mean, you're talking about, you think the roof is going to come off the building. There's so much joy and dancing and celebration. But let me tell you that something had paved the way for that joy, and that was many tears of repentance. 
that, that there was a, a depth of sorrow that gave way to a height of joy. And people being liberated, people being set free, people being changed, lost sinners being transformed. Remember we had a, a young man from Israel living with us who was more up and down than any human being I'd ever met. I mean, it, it's amazing how low he fell. It's amazing how high he bounced back up and we keep thinking, man, when is he going to stabilize? When is he going to stabilize? And when he was with us, he was, he was not walking with God, staying in our house, was not walking with God, but was happy to be there and come to some of the meetings. And he, he was a guy that commanded attention. You'd notice him in a room. And he had gone into a convenience store to pick something up one day, get something to eat or drink, whatever it was. And a few days later, he went back in there. But what happened in the interval was that he encountered God in the meetings. I mean, he had a life-changing experience with God, and the guy looked like he was glowing. And God brought him through real repentance and a deep wrenching of heart, out of which came this transformation of life. And he walked into the same convenience store, the same person behind the counter. He walked in, they said, what happened to you? Those, that's what they said when he walked in. What happened to you? That's the kind of transformation that, that comes, not just some superficial little thing. I'm talking about God getting hold of a life. I'm talking about gut-wrenching repentance because of that holy encounter with a holy God. I'm talking about recognizing His glory and His power, which gets us on our face. And out of that, out of that, something glorious. Out of that, a transformation of life. Out of that, an intimacy with God. Let me, let me give you a couple of examples of what can happen in the presence of a holy God. Some things that I saw with my own eyes when I was in Pensacola. There was a photographer who came. We would often have major media from New York Times to CNN to 60 Minutes to Rolling Stone magazine. I mean, everybody came in to cover what was happening in the revival. And, and some of the people were positively touched. Some wrote very positive stories like the New York Times. Others were more skeptical as understood, as expected. Well, the different people that were going to be covering the stories would sometimes send a photographer in, and, and it was in the days before cell phone cameras and things like that. We didn't allow cameras in the meetings, but we would announce to the congregation before the service, one of the ushers would say, we have a photographer here, professional photographer, he'll be taking pictures, so we just want you to know that's going to be happening. And also tell you, if you have a camera, don't pull it out, but he's allowed. Well, this particular night, Steve Hill preaches the message, another strong evangelistic repentance message. Steve preaches the message, and the cameraman is there. He's there to take pictures, and the whole night, he's clicking away. And it's in the days before digital, so he's switching rolls of film. He's taking hundreds and hundreds of pictures, sh shooting pictures, every angle, shooting, shooting, shooting. Steve gives the altar call, and this guy comes under heavy conviction. He's there to be taking pictures. But the Holy Spirit's moving so powerful. I, this is in front of my eyes. Hard to ever forget this. So in those days, we were sitting up in chairs on the platform, the, the leaders, and he comes, to the, he comes responding to the altar call. He's one of the first, and he's right next to me. He's right down there. And here's this guy with the camera around his neck, on his knees, sobbing sobbing and weeping. And then he'd look up through his tears and he'd see the other people sobbing at the altar and he'd take out his camera and start shooting and then go, oh, go back to sobbing. And then he'd get himself together a little, look up, take a few more pictures and then go back to sobbing. There was another cameraman that came in. He had done a photo book before, a photo display that focused on death, a morbid kind of avant-garde photographer in terms of his, some of his emphases. And he came, Jewish atheist, as I recall. And he goes through the whole meeting, but just fascinated by what's happening in Brownsville, heard the report, shows up, shows up. He hears the message, does not respond to the altar call. After the altar call, after ministering to everyone that comes forth, now we go and pray for people. A friend of his and mine says to him, would you like prayer? Would you like prayer? And he thought, okay, I'll let them pray for me. I don't know which of us prayed for him, 
But the power of God touched him and he fell to the ground and laying there on the ground, he began to cry out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then he said, but I don't believe in Jesus. (laughs) Jesus, Jesus, but I don't believe in Jesus. And then finally, just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He got wonderfully saved and put out an award-winning book of photographs of those who were touched and transformed in the revival. In the earliest days before I was there, two young women came down with Playboy magazine and they were going to be doing a photo shoot on the beach for Playboy. And anyway, hurricane weather came in, the photo shoot was canceled, they now have a free day in Pensacola, Florida. This is not apocryphal, this is a true story, this really happened. They hire a taxi and they say to him, Where's the action in Pensacola? It's all true. There's no no exaggeration here. So the taxi driver, I don't know whether he was just having fun with them or whatever, or they all thought the thing would be just silly, brings him over to the church. And the reason that we found out the story and, and found out what was happening was that at the end of the message... These two ladies are weeping and shaking. I mean, they're, they're, they're so undone, they're literally sweating because they're just weeping and shaking. And John Kilpatrick, the pastor, is curious, what's going on with these ladies? And goes over to talk to them and said, well, we, we've not led the best lives. And they start confessing their sin. They, they were there at best for a joke. And here they encounter God. And next thing, they're repenting at the altar, getting right with God. Friends, what we need more than anything is a visitation of the holy presence of God. What we need more than anything is the manifestation of the glory of the Lord. You know, when when the rain comes down and you're utterly and absolutely drenched, you don't need to tell anyone, it's raining. You don't need to tell someone, sister, the rain is all over you. When God is really moving and working, you don't need to announce it. Leonard Ravenhill always used to say, you don't have to advertise a fire. When the glory of the Lord would be manifest in ancient Israel, they'd see the cloud, they'd see the glory, they'd literally see God coming in manifestation. And sometimes they'd fall on their faces and cry out. Or fire would come out from his presence and consume sacrifices. It it happens in Leviticus, the end of the ninth chapter. It happens in 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. It happens in other passages. The fire of the Lord consumes sacrifices. 2 Samuel 24, Judges 13. I mean, these things happen. And and people are overwhelmed. They don't think, was that cool, man? Did you see what I just saw? Was that, come on, was that cool or what, man? No, they're on their faces. They're crying out. Reverence for God is the natural outworking of encountering His presence. And and we are in 21st century society that is much more superficial in many ways than past generations. We have so much access to everything being instant. There there are ways that, that we can be unchallenged. I'm not faulting our generation. I'm just saying it is what it is. And it's cured, that superficiality is cured by a deep encounter with a holy God. That superficiality is cured when we come back into His presence and and worship and adoration. And yes, out of it, out of those encounters, there there are beautiful times in His presence. In in, in revival in, in Scotland, in around 1839 or so, under the ministry of Robert Murray McShane, he would just talk about the love of God and how beautiful Jesus was and people would be weeping and undone. Duncan Campbell in the Hebrides Revival 1949 to 1952 said that the main emphasis of the preaching was the wrath of God and the main emphasis of the more than 80 hymns that were written in the midst of the revival was on the beauty of the Lord. So somehow people came under a sense of deep conviction Many of these people, traditional church people that didn't really know the Lord, they weren't really born again. 
they, they encounter him, they're undone with their sin, now they find his beauty and his love and his mercy and forgiveness. He who's forgiven much, Luke 7, loves much, right? Out of that encounter comes a deeper appreciation, a deeper reverence, a deeper awe. Charles Spurgeon talked about the, the man with the noose around his neck. He's sentenced to die. He's about to be hung. At the last moment, he's pardoned. That person has a deeper sense of appreciation. The gospel we preach today is basically, it's a good deal, sign on the dotted line. Things go better with Christ. And and we bypass repentance and we bypass the cross and we bypass the call to leave everything and follow Jesus. Of course, there's little reverence, little awe, little appreciation. When we recognize our lost estate, when we recognize the judgment we deserve, and we recognize how Jesus unconditionally gave himself for us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we understand that and recognize that, we live a life of gratefulness before God. And when we see how deeply he intervenes to touch us and change us, we walk with a holy reverence. I love the moving of the Spirit. I'm unashamedly Pentecostal, charismatic. In one of my books, I I wrote a chapter called Sola Scriptura, and therefore charismatic. In other words, because I believe the Bible alone is God's ultimate authority, ultimate word, ultimate expression in writing. Because I hold to that, I don't believe that God is giving revelation in addition to the Bible today, that we're getting new biblical books written or or new doctrinal uh, truths are being revealed about who God is. No, Sola Scriptura, because I believe in what's written in Scripture, therefore I'm charismatic. Because the Bible clearly talks about the gifts continuing. The Bible clearly talks about God's healing power and prophecy and and these things. It clearly speaks about God continuing to speak and act and move. And, and, And listen, I've been in all kinds of wonderful services from Africa to India, all over other parts of Asia and all over America, places where God's moving. I've just the last Sunday in Korea laying hands on people. The Holy Spirit fell dramatically. And if you were not used... To, to this type of stuff, you would have been scandalized. I mean, the people there were hungry and used to it. I began to pray. The Holy Spirit began to move. I could sense that he was moving. And I'm talking about people getting touched. I'm talking about reactions that you would have seen if someone put their foot in water with an electrical outlet running in there. I mean, they were getting zapped. Let it be. If it's the Holy Spirit and Jesus is being glorified, and lives are being changed, so be it. I love the moving of the Spirit. I welcome the moving of the Spirit. But this is not just some silly game. This is not just, oh, look at the power of God. We're talking about a holy God. And in Exodus, the 20th chapter, there's a very interesting account there. And I'll bring this to a close shortly. And this is not some systematic message, but the same point hammered from 50 different angles. The first reference to the fear of the Lord in the Bible is in Genesis, the 20th chapter. The second is in Exodus, the 20th. And in in Genesis, Abraham says to the, the people in Gerar that his wife Sarah is actually his sister because he's thinking, if they think I'm married to her, she's a beautiful woman, they're going to kill me and take her. So he says, she's my sister. But then the the king takes her for himself. He doesn't kill Abraham, but takes her for himself. And God appears to him in a dream and says, don't you touch her. The man's a prophet. Don't you touch her. And and God says, I I know that that in the integrity of your heart, you you didn't know that you were doing something wrong. So that's why I stopped you from touching her. But when the king says to Abraham, what have you done? You almost caused us to commit a great sin. You must led me into adultery. Abraham says, I, I thought surely there's no fear of God in this place. In other words, there's no God consciousness. There's no fear of God. The people are just going to do whatever. The second time it occurs is in Exodus, the 20th chapter, when God speaks on Mount Sinai and the people are absolutely terrified. The nation is terrified. And they, they're undone. And they tell Moses, you speak. Don't let God speak anymore. We're going to die. Just hearing his voice, we're going to die. And and what does Moses say? He says, don't fear. God has come to put his presence before you. Right? Why? So that you will fear and not sin. Some translations say, don't be afraid. God's put his presence here so that you will fear and not sin. But it's the same word in Hebrew. 
and, and yeah, what he is saying is, don't be afraid. God's not going to kill you just because you're standing here. Don't be afraid, but fear. <laughs> don't, don't have some wrong kind of fear, have a right kind of fear. We've thrown out the wrong kind of fear and the right kind of fear. We've thrown out the unhealthy fear. The, the fear is if God is some drunken parent that I alluded to earlier, and he's just out to get us. We've thrown out the wrong fear, the, the fear of a slave for a master, and I'm going to get beaten if I don't work hard enough. We've thrown out the wrong fear, rightfully so, but we've also thrown out the right fear. We've thrown out that, the deep reverence for God. And I tell you, if, if God comes in real revival, you may have unusual manifestations. You may have things that are very different than what you're used to. You may have weeping. You may have laughter. But I assure you that at some point in the process, there will be an encounter with a holy God that will produce repentance and change. And if that's not happening, it's not revival. If that's not happening, it's not visitation. Not because of some historic definition to put on it, but because of divine reality. Like I could say, if the ground is parched and there's no rain and the crops are dying, if you have one week of rain, that, that, that earth will be saturated. Why? Because that's what rain does. That's what water does. This is what the presence of God does. So I'm in Italy in 1996, and I was speaking from Acts 2 one night. We were in northern Italy, in the city of Milano, or Milan as, as we call it. And it was this big old building, didn't have air conditioning, it was June, pretty warm in there. And in order to close the windows, the ushers had to go grab these big poles with hooks and grab something at the top and close the window. I'd seen them do it before, so you kind of remembered what they had to do. I'm preaching from Acts, the second chapter. I'm about to read the verse, and suddenly there came a sound like that of a rushing violent wind. I, I was about to read the verse when suddenly a sound of a wind came. I mean, suddenly the wind starts gusting heavily. And everybody looks around and the ushers jump up quick and they go to start closing the, the windows. And I said, I guess now would be an appropriate time for me to read the verse. Okay, the next night I'm in Torino, Turin. I'm under a tent that seats maybe about a thousand people. And before I get up to speak, my translator, who almost n never gives a mini message before I speak, he wants to say something first. He wants to give a message first. And he begins to to preach from Acts, uh, from Zechariah, the 10th chapter, ask the Lord for rain in the time of rain. That's what I was going to preach on. That was my theme. That was my message. Zechariah 10, ask the Lord for rain in the time of rain. So I got up to preach thinking, this is amazing. Same theme on both of our hearts. It's time for rain. That was my message. It's time for rain. And I remember preaching the message and giving the altar call, and there were some lost sinners there. I still remember some gals that were encountering Jesus for the first time and really coming to know the Lord. And as they're there crying at the altar, their makeup is running. It's always a sacred sight. People being touched by God. You know, this is something very special about it. Just, it's very beautiful to me. These days it could be men also with the makeup, but, but either way. <laughs> Either way, there's, you know, the repentance and those, those beautiful tears streaming down the cheeks as the, the mascara is running and whatever else is happening. And, and, and the message is, is finished, okay? The place was packed out. They had to lift the sides of the tent to get room for people to stand around the back. I finished the message. We finished the altar call. Boom! Suddenly, rain begins pouring. And you know what it's like in a tent. You know what it's like in a tent. So the night before we had the wind, this night we had the rain. Just boom! Just like that. And we all looked around with a smile, but, but God was moving. It was, it was a sense of a divine promise. And then during that same season, I went to the Czech Republic, my one and only time in the Czech Republic. It was about 120 leaders, couples that had gathered from around the country. They'd come together to be in these meetings. It was an annual thing, and they, they, they went to the campgrounds of, a, of an old Bible college there. And there were accommodations enough for a number of people, and then others brought little tents and pitched them on the property, and that's where they would stay. The trip is memorable in many ways, one of them being that my luggage did not arrive for three days. 
And in this little out-of-the-way town in the Czech Republic, it was hard to find clothes that fit me. So I remember being physically uncomfortable, but God was moving. It was a Thursday morning, and I preached a message, and the Holy Spirit began to move, and next thing, people began to publicly confess their sins. I didn't call for it, I didn't ask for it, but the conviction came so deeply at this leaders' meeting that they began confessing their sins. Now they're all speaking in Czech, so someone's translating for me so I understand what's going on. But you can hear the, you can hear the cries, you can watch them with their faces wrenched. And what struck me was some of the women confessing to pornography addiction. These were leaders' wives. It's one thing to hear men, but now women confessing. And it was deep, and they're praying for each other and hugging each other. And, and I said to myself, the glory's coming tonight. Repentance prepares the way. The glory is coming tonight. And that night, during worship, one guy's playing guitar, and he just starts kind of strumming, and everyone just starts singing in the Spirit, and next thing, God's presence just comes sweeping in this place. I mean, the real presence of God just comes sweeping in, and without anybody leading us for the next three-plus hours, we encountered God. At one point, a key leader got up and tried to kind of put an interpretation of what was happening. And you could see everyone just kind of cringing. And I just put my arm and I said, Brother, please, please, you're in danger of quenching the spirit, what he's doing. He just stepped back. And we had visitation. Now check this out. There was a family. The dad was in the meetings, but the mom was under the tent with her sons. And she's reading a bedtime story to them. Whatever's going on, they're about to go to sleep. And suddenly, one of them says, I hear the sound of thunder. I hear the sound of thunder. We were a good distance away in our meeting hall. They're in this tent down the property. I hear the sound of thunder. And then the sound kept going. It kept going and going and going. And then the other son said, it's planes. There are planes flying overhead. There are planes flying overhead. And then they said, no, that's not it. These are little boys. They said, it's the sound of drunk people. I mean, shades of Acts 2, that the people didn't know what was happening. They said, these men are drunk. And they heard that when the spirit fell. The wife was wondering what in the world is going on. They thought it was the sound of thunder or the sound of jets overhead. Then this, this raucous sound of people. What they heard was God coming into our midst. And, and as a result of that, I mean, people impacted. People impacted because they've encountered God. And the repentance that took place earlier in the day prepared the way for the glory of the Lord. So, years back, I was looking at different things. People were saying, this is revival, that's revival. And I said, Lord, move however you want to move. Move through, through whomever you want to move. If, if, if it's my privilege to read about the next revival rather than to participate it and lead it, whatever, move, Lord. We want you to move. Whoever, you be exalted. Work through whoever you want to work. And I'm not Mr. Know-it-all. And I know some about revival, but you're God. Move how you want to move. Because a lot of the things seem to defy the conventions. A lot of the things that were supposed to be revival seemed to be contrary to what I had learned to expect. But as it went on, you realized, okay, it really wasn't. It really wasn't. Why? Because it did not ultimately bring that supernatural encounter with the Holy God. It did not bring the weight and the glory of His presence. I don't mean every meeting has to be like that. I don't mean every moment has to be like that. But I mean at some point, as we're talking about revival, as that's a theme, at some point there must be that deeper encounter. And A.W. Tozer pointed out that the person that's really encountered God in the holy place doesn't just go around boasting and announcing it for the world to hear. And that Paul, when he has a third heaven experience, and he talks about it in third person in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, what does he say? Can't even speak about these things. Forbidden to even speak about these things. And one of my friends said, you know, I know so-and-so, a particular friend of his, he said, he's one of the most carnal guys I know, and he claims to spend about 75% of his time up in the third heaven. Something's, something's missing there. Something's wrong there. If, if I've been out in drenching rain most of the day and I come walking in for a few minutes, I'm all wet. 
when you're really encountering God in the heavenly place, you will be changed. You will be changed by His presence. You will be changed by His Spirit. If you're in the presence of the Lord, you'll become like that Lord. From glory to glory, there will be a growing in Him. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we're flawless or sinless. It means we're changed. It means we're changed. And again, I've been in many, many different settings. And often with young people and celebrating the Lord with them. I'll say it again. I love the joy of the Lord. I love the celebration of the Lord. I love the outpouring and the moving of the Holy Spirit. But when you have the privilege and joy of being close with men like David Wilkerson or Leonard Ravenhill, Leonard Ravenhill had the privilege of being close with A.W. Tozer, there was a certain reverence that they walked in. There was a certain respect for God and His Word that they walked in. When I hear something is supposed to be revival and the Word is trivialized or unimportant, you know again something foundational is missing. And even if God's moving, the thing can't last because it's not built on the right foundation. And Leonard Ravenhill said the, the most amazing thing that he ever heard from Tozer, that Tozer said sometimes he just spends hours on his face, prostrate before God. Prostrate before God. <laughs> hours laying on his face in the presence of God. He said not saying a word, just gazing on his beauty. I think that's deep. That's intense. That level of encounter. And then you read what Tozer writes. My problem with Tozer's books is I underline every line. Every line is like, oh yeah, that's good. Ooh, that speaks. Yeah, I want to quote that. But there was that depth of encounter that produced that depth of ministry. Surely we are in a very superficial time in church history here in 21st century North America and a very superficial time in our culture. Surely we need to be deepened by a deeper encounter with God. And that's the essence of revival. Father, I pray you take these simple words and drill them home to us. May we encounter you more deeply, I pray, and make you known to a dying world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.